And all God's people said, mm, God is good. And all the time. Oh. So we're in Luke chapter 1, beginning with verse 26. And we come to this second week of Advent celebration. And my heart is excited uh, as it pertains to what's being announced. If you'll join me in this chapter, Luke 1, you'll recall in verse 26 an incredible, incredible intro into the narrative, the story of the birth announcement of Jesus Christ. Reading from verse 26, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent. In the sixth month, what an incredible backdrop to the announcement of the birth of Christ. For this six-month chronological mark designates that the backdrop references that Elizabeth and Zechariah are having a son who will be John the Baptist, the forerunner, announcing that the Messiah is to come. So what an amazing announcement, even at the cusp of seeing the historical reference to John the Baptist. But we continue reading. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God. Sent by God. Consider how heaven engages earth when an angel stepped in. Consider how when an angel stepped in that God made his plan known. When an angel stepped in. When an angel stepped in, it was as if you heard the voice of God speaking because indeed you had heard his message. When an angel stepped in. When an angel stepped in historically, there was either really, really good news or really, really bad news. When an angel stepped in. When an angel stepped in, you could certainly assume safely that God was bringing care and direction to his people when an angel stepped in. When an angel stepped in, you most certainly would see God announcing blessings or pronouncing judgment when an angel stepped in. When an angel stepped in, God was declaring that his word would be fulfilled when an angel stepped in at that perfect time. An angel stepped in to the life of one we know as Mary and announced the greatest announcement that has ever been since or before or after. This is the announcement of the Christ who has come. When Gabriel stepped in to make this announcement of the birth of Christ to Mary, Mary heard a, a message and the content therein that was not only life-altering to her, but changing for the entire universe forever when, when the angel stepped in. And Gabriel announced that Christ has come. And I want to ask you to consider this question. I know that this is not the first Christmas sermon you've heard. I understand that. And I understand we've heard these truths preached again and again to the point that maybe we say, what more could be said about this? But I would like to ask you to lean in, maybe even more closely than you ever have before, to the announcement that the angel brought as you ask yourself this vital question, what does this announcement mean to me? And what does it mean for me? When the angel stepped in and said, the Messiah is coming. Before I uh, continue with you in this discovery of what the birth announcement means to us, 
I would like to uh, show you something really, really unique. So I, I need to lean into the scripture just real closely for a moment. And when I look at Luke chapter 1, verse 28, uh, verse 26 already announces uh, that the angel came to one we know as Mary. But verse 28 tells us the, the angel came to her. There are translations that help us to understand why this is such an emphatic piece of the original narrative of God's holy word. Uh, the uh, the uh, NIV translation states the angel went to her. The Holman Christian Standard Bible translate, uh, translates the angel uh, came to her. The New American Standard says uh, that the angel coming in spoke to her. The original text of the, of the Greek language of the New Testament gives to us a word that actually means that the angel stepped inside to where Mary was seated. He stepped into her life and he made this announcement known. Most certainly she had had her plans drawn already in her mind and heart. But God's message stepped into her life. There are two facts here about how the angel entered abruptly and then very closely and personally as he stepped in to give this message. So I I look at this phrase, the angel stepped in, not as simply a, a, a semantic piece of the narrative as it reads, but I see in here something very representative and, and emblematic of what Jesus desires to see in our hearts right now. For Christ most certainly has stepped in. And it, it behooves us, it demands us that we respond to the Christ. For he has stepped in and the message of this announcement, and really close and personal, we see the truth of, of Jesus. So I ask you to join me with this question. Uh, what does the announcement of the narrative of, uh, of the birth of Jesus mean for me? And pray that you'll ask that for your own life. And I want to share with you for just a brief moment four facts from this announcement that will truly, truly become, a, I believe, a life-changing uh, application for our for you and for me. Four facts that help us to see what this announcement actually is intended for us. And these four facts actually lead you to a life of peace as you understand along with Mary all that God has desired and has accomplished in and through His Son, Jesus Christ. So I want to take you to that first fact for just a moment. Uh, built upon the opening verses, listen again to verse 26. And, and in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God, to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to be married to a man by the name of Joseph, who was of the lineage of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and the angel came to her and said, Rejoice, favored woman, the Lord is with you. But she was deeply troubled by this statement and wondered what type of greeting it could be. And the angel said to her, Don't be afraid, for you have found favor with God. Now listen, you will conceive and give birth to a son. You will call his name Jesus. For he will be great and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom will have no end. Listen to the voice of God spoken. As we see the announcement of Christ celebrated from the pages and into our hearts with this first fact of the announcement, God manifested his work in Mary so that Christ would be manifested uh, to the world. Now, I know that seems primary, but we are looking at, at very precious and foundational truths to what this season of Advent means to us, and particularly what this birth announcement should mean uh, to you and to me. Uh, God has manifested his work in Mary so that Jesus Christ would be manifested to the world. Please understand in these verses we just read, Mary's life was not the end, nor was her life the ultimate expression of this announcement. She was but a part. God began with her. But the ultimate end of the announcement was and is Jesus. God began and manifested through her that which we know as the Christ, God's Son, the Gospel which has changed the world. Now, to better understand how the simplicity of this fact should change us, uh, consider two realities here. First, the reality of Mary's life, and then secondly, uh, the reality of God's work. First, look at the reality of Mary's life. When verse 26 opened, uh, we're, told, uh, we're told certainly of uh, 
uh, through the chronology of the six-month mark, we're told of her relation to Elizabeth and to uh, Zechariah. Uh, we're also told in verse 26 of her ethnicity and her geographical uh, origin. We're told of her, her progeny. When we continue reading through these verses, we're even told of something very personal in her life. We are told of her, uh, her, non, her non-consummated betrothal to Joseph. So we're being given some very personal details of this first reality, the reality of, of Mary's life. But we're also told that the one to which she has been betrothed but did not know in the deepest relational and physical way, but nonetheless the betrothal had begun, and his name is Joseph, a part of the lineage of the house of David, representing this incredible prophetic backdrop, backdrop of historicity and, and movement from Israel's fallenness to their redemption in the Messiah and to the redemption that will be offered and presented through the cross to the entire world. We're given some incredible details of Mary's life. But in uh, verse 29, we, we see that she was called, uh, in verse 28, she was called favored. So another detail of Mary's life is something unique God is doing within her for uh, the angel said you were, you were highly favored. In verse 29, we're told that Mary is greatly troubled. The, the term there is overwhelmed, maybe even agitated. She's bothered and doesn't know what to make of this announcement. We see the humility of her life, do we not? For when the, when the angel said, Mary, you're highly favored, we do not see her saying, well, I thought I probably was. I was hoping I would be that one. No, she's troubled by this. She's uncertain as to what this means. Now, please understand, because of... Her heritage, uh, Mary knew the Old Testament scriptures. She understood the prophecies. She knew that the Messiah would come through the birth of a virgin. She also knew that her own life of purity and chasteness was there, and it was real. And the angel said, you're favored. And this agitated her. She, she stepped back. So at this point, we see the details of Mary's life, but they're shadowed by this second reality, the reality of God's work. Notice God's work, verse 30. The angel said to her, Mary, don't be afraid, for you have found favor with God. And don't be afraid, for you have found favor. Understand that God's about to tell her that he's going to manifest a work in her but it's not about her. It's about the one who will come through her to be manifested to the world. And so she's been called favored, but she's not been called one who is full of grace. She's been called one who has, just like you and me, has received grace and favor. This is not a prayer. This is a salutation from the heavenly being saying to Mary, God has bestowed upon you favor. She's not the source of the grace. Only our God and our Christ is, but she became a glorious recipient as God singled her out and said, I'm choosing you to receive my favor. And so beginning with verse 30, we see the work of God. And so his favor is poured upon her. This word favor comes from a root that actually means grace. God gave her the grace and God gave her his presence through the Holy Spirit that she could conceive and bear a son. Oh, but then God's word became so much more clear to her because up to this point, she is greatly troubled. She's uncertain as to what all this means. And when God announced that she's found favor, he then announced in verse 31, you'll give birth to a son, you'll call his name, you ready for this? You'll call his name Yeshua. For that's what she heard. From the Aramaic, she heard that which was given in the Old Testament, a name that means Savior. Her mind uh, perhaps raced back to her Old Testament Hebrew heritage wherein God had raised up a man by the name of Joshua to lead the people of Israel into the Promised Land. And she's possibly remembering Joshua was that leader God used to save. We are told he foreshadows one who is coming as the ultimate Savior. And God said, Mary, your son will be called Yeshua, Jesus. 
And at that very moment, I can imagine that Mary is thinking, well, if, if, if I'm to give him life, he will, be, he will be born as a man. But if he bears the name Yeshua from God, he has to be the Messiah, fully God. Fully man, she began to see the work of God so clearly, not in contrast to her own life's reality, but overshadowing her life's reality. She saw the work of God. Verse 32, we call the Son of the Most High, reminiscent of those passages we've read in the Old Testament, written some 700 years before this, such as Isaiah 9, where Jesus is called the, the Holy One, the child who will be called Great. Those same references are made here in Luke 1.32. At the end of verse 32, he'll be, he'll be given the throne of his father David because certainly Israel's history has with it that David's reign was a reign that foreshadowed the coming of the Messiah. Even the Old Testament calls David reign as a, as a reign that will have no end. David has died. The, the preacher in the book of Acts, Peter, said his bones, were, were, his, his bones were buried like any other person, but his kingdom foreshadowed the kingdom of Christ who has no end. This becomes the meaning that fell upon the ears of Mary, and they fall upon our hearts today recognizing God's work, His complete work in Christ that began in Mary, but through Mary, his work in bringing us Christ is the ultimate end. Now, isn't this like our God who he wants to work in the lives of those who want to surrender their hearts to him? But when he works in our lives, the ultimate end is never us. It's always Jesus. His work always points to who Christ is. He pours his love out in us so that our lives might point to the Christ. Such a fundamental truth that it began actually here as the angel gave Mary this announcement that she will give birth to Jesus. So you see the reality of Mary's life, all the details there. Then you see the reality of God's work. Did you notice the door that connects the two? Because perhaps there are those of us here who need that door. Because there are those of us who we know the reality of our lives. But we scarcely find it comfortable to live in the reality of God's work in our life because of this door. That door can be found back in verse 20... Uh, Back in verse 30, when the angel said to Mary, don't, don't be afraid. Isn't it that fear becomes the door? And so that, that anxiousness that developed when the angel said, you're the favorite one, and Mary did not know what to make of this, that fear grew, but the angel said, don't fear God's favor. Don't fear. Live in his favor. Many of us need that door today to move from that work which God begins in our life so that our lives can become more about his work that reality, Mary's a beautiful demonstration that God manifested his work of Christ in her, but she was not the ultimate reason for this announcement. She was just a vessel like you and me. The ultimate reason for the announcement was indeed Christ. And the favor that the angel announced wasn't just a capsuled favor over Mary's life so, she, so that she could endure this announcement or this assignment. The favor also capsuled over the identity of who Christ would be to you and to me. This is God's grace. This is God's favor. In 1943, a man by the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer sat in a Nazi prison cell, picked up a piece of decaying parchment, and began to write these words. And when you hear these words, you'll know at what time of the year these words were written. He wrote down this statement and handed it to a friend, and not long after this, uh, he suffered his execution at the hand of, of Germany. But this is what he wrote. A prison cell wherein one is completely dependent upon the fact that the door of freedom has to be opened from the outside is not a bad picture of Advent. God has reached in through his son Jesus and has opened from the outside a door of freedom. This is the emphasis of this first fact. It is God bringing Christ. Let's not get caught up in the, in the aesthetics of the Christmas story and the announcement and even parse out our allegiance and our devotion to where man thinks they must fall. The objective and the ultimate goal of this announcement is Christ. And he came. And he is the Messiah. Savior of the world. Now understand, 
that there are many who would say, oh, I wish I could live in His grace. I wish I could know His grace and His favor. That there are facts in my life that keep that favor from being fully trusted and lived out. And, and I would say, well, at times you may find yourself at a crisis with fact and faith. And that takes us to our second fact. The second fact of this birth announcement declares that Mary encountered a crisis of fact and faith that only the truth of Jesus could resolve. Notice in verse 34, Mary asked the angel, how can this be? I do not know a man. Uh, please understand this. There is no evidence in this passage that Mary doubted that what the angel said would come true. In fact, there's just the opposite. If you were to fast forward, same chapter, but verse 45, you would read her appraisal from Elizabeth. She who has believed is blessed because she believed what was spoken to her by the Lord would be fulfilled. She believed what Gabriel was saying. Okay, I, I understand this. It frightens me, but I understand this. Verse 34, she raises up not to discount the faith, but to bring the fact, but I don't know a man. How is this possible? This does not become a crisis of faith wherein one says, I don't think this will happen, but a crisis of fact and faith. While I believe this will, ha will happen, I just don't know how. That was her question. The present tense, I don't know a man, is actually used here as a summary to indicate that all of her past activity in life could be resulting and, and, and accurately summarized in this one statement. I have never known physically in a consummation way a man. So tell me, Gabriel, how is this to happen? Her faith, in fact, collided a bit, although briefly. For she believed and she knew God's truth to be real. But the conflict came when she wondered, how? How can this be? But you see later that Mary surrendered that heart because of the facts that prefaced the conflict and the crisis. The facts are Jesus. Jesus. Jesus is coming. So that is how we resolve the tension between fact and faith. So Mary journeyed through. So this becomes our application as well when your faith and believing in God seems to be colliding with some fact that you know that seems impossible to reverse or insurmountable. Oh, please hear the one truth when that collision takes place. Jesus. You would say, Pastor, I believe God wants to do this, but I can't see that it's possible because of this. I only have one response. Jesus. His favor, His grace, His power, His transforming presence. And so this encounter of, of a crisis of fact and faith became resolved in Mary's life because of Jesus. It's a beautiful picture of what the announcement of the birth of Christ is, is all about. But then we... We see God doing something incredible through the angel's message for Mary. We come to this next verse, which gives us a third fact of the birth announcement. And the angel replied to her, so verse 35 reveals, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. And therefore the Holy One will be born, and He will be called the Son of God. A third fact is this. The Holy Spirit made the purpose of Christ reality. So Mary's thinking, how is this possible? And you hear what God spoke in the opening of verse 35. The Holy Spirit. Oh. Can you imagine the transition in Mary's heart from, I really want to believe you, but I don't know a man. I, I don't know what needs to come next. How is this to happen? For Mary's doubt was really a challenge for her to not know her next step. God, what is to come next? And Gabriel announcing from God this word, the Holy Spirit. And can you imagine Mary thinking, oh, oh, this is supernatural. This has nothing to do with me. I'm a vessel. 
At times, I think we see God wanting to do something in our lives, but instead of going to the, to the place of saying, God, I trust your Holy Spirit, we tend to ask, how can this be? I had better take matters into my own hands and make something happen. And thankfully, God had already worked a miracle in Mary's heart because her response wasn't, okay, I need to figure out what to do about this, but simply to say, God, you've got me. I have no clue how this is going to happen. And God said, Holy Spirit, this is totally supernatural. This was not in part supernatural. The birth of Christ was supernatural in its completeness. This is theological revelation here. Jesus was born of a virgin. This is a supernatural, miraculous event. And I want you to see something here that is so incredible. When in verse 35, Gabriel said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. Uh, look at this. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. Now, well, this term for overshadow can actually be found in Luke chapter 9, verse 34, when on the Mount of Transfiguration, when Jesus in all of his glory was revealed, a cloud overshadowed them. And the very same word is used here so that Mary will know the Holy Spirit will overshadow you. The glory of Christ will make this possible. What a beautiful picture. And I want you to see this. This is such a powerful piece of the birth announcement. And then the angel said, once the Holy Spirit overshadows you and, and does God's wonder in you, notice, the Holy One, the Holy One to be born. The Holy One to be born will be called the Son of the Most High. Notice that Jesus did not become the Holy One when he was born. If you look at the original text, the text is screaming out with clarity and with sacred definiteness, the Holy One who is present in the bosom of God, the, the darling of heaven, the one, the pre-incarnate Christ, Jesus who's always been, the Holy One. When the Holy Spirit overshadows you, the Holy One will be born. He will enter the world through Mary's vessel and he will be with us. Completely God, completely in the flesh of man so that we can behold, John 1, 14, declare the glory of the Son as the only begotten of the Father. The Holy Spirit made the purpose of Christ reality. Mary said, I'm obedient, but that was the extent of her contribution. God brought this beautiful, supernatural entrance into the world of Messiah. I think you'll find this interesting. In 2015, a research entity known as the Pew Research of America surveyed Americans with the following question. How many of you believe all four facts, that Jesus was born and laid in a manger, that the angels visited the shepherds, and that the wise men brought gift. Oh, and number four, and the most important, that Jesus was born of a virgin. How many of you Americans, the survey asked, believe in all four? Now, there were different percentages that believe one or two of the four. But how many of you believe all four was the question posed just three, uh, two years ago to our, to our nation? You may find this impossible to, to believe, but two-thirds, 65% of Americans believe in the virgin birth, believe that he was laid in a manger, believe the angel visited the shepherds, and believe the wise men came, 65%. So how do we find ourselves as a culture today in probably one of the most depreciated cultures as it pertains to Christmas, where we've moved from Merry Christmas to Happy Holidays so that we're not offending anyone? How does a culture who believes in the virgin birth digress to suppressing the true message of Christmas? Well, the answer is very simple. The answer is 16 inches from the head to the heart. We as a culture are not ignorant to the fact that Jesus is God's son. We're not ignorant to that fact at all. But perhaps the, the draws of this culture and maybe even human pride causes us to reject Jesus as King of Kings when we know the truth. And so I declare with a 
with a heart that is excited about this announcement that the Holy Spirit did a supernatural work and has brought to earth through the love of God and the hand of God the Messiah, the Christ. And so we come to the fourth and final fact of this passage. Notice what happened. I'll, I'll move to the uh, final verse, verse 38. The angel had reminded Mary about Elizabeth and that she conceived John the Baptist in her old age. And then the angel had said, nothing's impossible with God. But look at the response of Mary in verse 38. I am the Lord's servant. The fourth fact is this. The reality of Christ causes worshipful obedience. Did you notice how Mary said to Gabriel, but was speaking, I believe, to God and to Christ? And she said, I am your bondservant. The older translations read, I am your handmaiden. The, the accuracy of that statement as it resonates with worshipful obedience comes from that which the term doulos in the original text actually indicates the term doulos, which is what we have here in feminine form, is someone saying not, I will serve, but actually, I'm indenturing myself to you as servant and slave. See, it's one, it's one practice to say I'll serve because it's, it's possibly the appropriate response, but it's a completely different fact to say I'm your bond slave because serving has to do with what I think I should be doing as a notable act Bond slave is, I am surrendering my complete life to the significant other person. Mary looked at God and said, I'm your handmaiden, I'm your bond servant. I just don't want to uh, practice congenial religion and say, I'll try to serve. I'm telling you, I am your slave. I'm obeying you. I'm yours. That is the, perhaps, actually, in reality, the only response to be made when you see the Messiah for who he is. Worshipful obedience. Jesus, I'm yours. I'm yours. So I, I look at this announcement many, many times over as you have. I hear the Advent message many times over as you have. And I consider the message in the announcement saying, to Mary, Christ is coming. But then when you look closely, you, you understand God did something specific in Mary, but it was never about Mary. It was about Christ. He wants to do that in your life right now. He wants to do something so significant to pour His love in you so that it can be about who Jesus is to you and how your life can point to Jesus. And yet at times we're fearful because we don't know what it would mean to, to turn our lives completely over to the Lord. And we have to go through that crisis of of fact and faith, but then we realize through God's presence in our life, known as the Holy Spirit, He can handle anything if we'll just allow that to be laid in His, His hands. And we realize when we see Jesus for who He is, then our hearts dissolve into worshipful obedience as we say, along with the words of the Scripture, I'm yours. I'm your bondservant, God. Whatever you desire, oh, that's what I'll do. So I want to ask you this second week of Advent to consider that the birth announcement of Jesus Christ is more than just information being passed, but actually an opportunity for examination. So consider this. If you were to say, Pastor, I have never truly placed my faith in Jesus. I've only been practicing religious activity. I've, I've distanced myself. I'm, I'm fine with where I am. Consider the love that God has poured out, that he wants you to know the healing and the hope and the joy that can come into your life as you place your faith in Christ and ask for his forgiveness and surrender in that worshipful obedience to say, Jesus, I'm yours. If you've never made that prayer and laid your life down and asked for his forgiveness and salvation, I encourage you to do that today. Perhaps you know Christ and you follow him. And perhaps you would say, my life, has, has been distracted. I let the aesthetics of this world and what people think of me and what I think of myself uh, disregard how God wants to do something real in my life if I'll just obey Him and 
Perhaps he's calling you to a life of deeper obedience. However God is calling this morning, when the angel made the announcement, we heard God's voice, and he said, here's my son. And the scripture says, if he did not withhold his own son from us, how will he not with him freely give us all things? Come to Jesus today. See him for who he is, as King of kings and Lord of lords. He's the only name that truly matters. Will you give your life to him today? Let's stand for prayer.